Welcome back, WNST, Towson, and Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We have merged the streams and the brands around here after nearly three decades. On the December 13th, it'll be 29 years of doing sports radio. Uh, we have now added a little spice to that, which brings me to my next segment. I, you know, I tell you, it's been a long time since I've had Howard Bryant on the program, and I follow him out on Twitter. We were sort of ships passing in the night, maybe a decade, decade and a half ago, and various points at uh, the sporting events and such. And we have a mutual dear, dear friend of ours from San Francisco, California. I welcome him in from uh, parts of Western Mass. We welcome Howard Bryant. Full dissident back in. What's going on, man? How are you? It's a pleasure to, to see you. People say you're Zoom. <laughs> they say, I get to look at the people I like, you know? Oh, that's that's – that's different, although your, your audience may not want to see that. I'm dragging this morning. Oh, the, you know, I mean, it happens. It's a pandemic. Um, g- give me... Any- Go ahead. I What's that? Been any- I haven't been anywhere since March, except the grocery store and the gas station. Give me life during pandemic for you. What's, I mean, and, and, you know, I know you through reporting and sports and writing and ESPN and all the things that, that we do and the people, the mutual friends we would have through baseball and basketball and sports and football and all the things we do. But th- this has been fascinating for me to just call around and chat with people I've known for a couple of decades about how this changes. None of us ever thought sports would just shut down. I don't think any of us really saw tyranny building up in the country. Uh, and certainly where we are in this transition, uh, it's alarming to even old sports writers like us, right? Yeah, well, for me, it's been – it's it's been locked down. I mean, I think that the biggest transition so far has been that for somebody that's been on the road 150 days a year for the last quarter century, I haven't been on an airplane since March. It's I haven't been anywhere. No hotels, no none of that. I've been in the house the whole time, and that's been all right. I mean, the writing side of it actually hasn't really changed because I write in the house anyway. But I think just the entire sort of social, I mean, the routine of your life has changed. Right, you have to sort of get used to the fact that the way the rhythm of your life, that the way it's gone for all those years, you know, no ballparks, no, no access, no, I mean, everything we're doing now is text, telephone. I'm wondering what it's going to be like walking into a, a clubhouse and when that's going to be. Well, I don't think they'll ever let us back in, Howard. I mean, I, you know, that's like, I had my... anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, Angelos took my press pass in 2006 and decided that much like the Trump administration, there could be no criticism of anything regarding the baseball team. And 15 years later, the stadium's empty. The brand is dead. I mean, it is dead on arrival. The Nationals are down the road. They're touting a a pretty competitive product that people want to see there. And the Orioles only have a ballpark and a shell and by the way, and I know you were around here at Camden Yards many, many times. This is year 30, bro. This is the last year of the lease. So Camden Yards, the new shiny gem for ba- – it's 29 and a half years old now, bro. We're coming up on 30. And the state now has to figure out a deal to keep the baseball team here in this environment when who knows whom from the Angelos family is going to ask for what. And I know you've seen all those changes up in Boston. Yeah, well, no doubt. Well, I think that the stability of the Orioles, I mean – it's it's it is fascinating to me when you think about it in in, in terms of most sports that there's if, if you're of a certain generation there are certain bedrocks that you expect if you're a football fan of my generation it's amazing that the miami dolphins have been completely irrelevant for all these years it used to be you, you couldn't you couldn't turn on the tv without having to deal with the with the raiders and the and the dolphins and, you know, baseball-wise, if you're of my generation, the, the Orioles were the bedrock franchise. They were the ones who were the ones who did it right. They were the ones who had, you know, that, that team from you know, 1966 to 1983, that they were the standard bearer as much as the Yankees or anybody else. And to see what they've done and where they've been the last 30 years, it's just very, very different. And it, it just shows you once more that the, the time periods that are most important to you may disappear. I mean, if you're talking to people of a new generation now, they don't think about the Orioles. The Orioles, as you were saying, they're just not even a factor. It's a very different, very different time. 
Well, in traveling around the baseball, if we want to stick on baseball for a minute, yeah, I was out in Kansas City a couple years ago when, when they won. I was out in San Francisco with our mutual friend Julio Bermejo several times uh, through the yeah. Giants where every couple of years they did something beautiful beginning back in 2002 when I was out there for the Anaheim series and sat in the, yeah. in, in the dugout with Joe Madden in, in Angels mm-hmm. gear before he was Joe Madden. He was the guy with the funny glasses uh, and the wisdom and all that stuff. So, you know, 20 years later to see – what the Orioles have become, what baseball has become, and then this sort of long, cold winter where we're shutting down the minor leagues, we're shutting down the system, the rich guys are getting richer, the, the poor guys are getting poor, and then Tampa goes to the World Series and the Dodgers and all this stuff. But I, I'm wondering who's going to pay 60 80 $120 once all this is over with to go sit next to somebody in a ballpark and watch home runs and strikeouts, literally. Yeah, well, there's that. And then there's also the people who are going to pay just to sit next to somebody. When is that level of confidence going to return to the culture, whether we're talking about baseball or, or basketball, especially basketball and hockey indoors with no bubble like they're going to do next month? And then also even just, you know, going to the movies. So this is it, it's the we've been talking about this for a long time about this idea of a sports bubble. And that this idea that this bubble was never going to burst. Well, this is going to be the biggest challenge. And I think that just switching gears for a quick second, when you think about the speed in which the NBA is recognizing that they're going to have free agency, a draft in a regular season, all before December 22nd, that tells you those numbers are pretty dire, that they need to play. Well, they need to, they all need to play, right? And TV needs them, just like TV probably needed the other guy, you know, on television every minute of every day on Twitter uh, for CNN and for, for, for news. I mean, we're in the media business and we're in the sports business, and yet I find it fascinating as an FCC owner, as a citizen, uh, as someone who is politically active most of the time in various ways, that stick to sports has become – this sort of refrain and as uh, as as you go full dissident here uh, on Twitter and uh, you you know and I know the ESPN side of this and the Fox side is everybody has an opinion but sports stopped for six months and anyone in the sports business had to think like what can we do to get back and dude I look at the NFL now and I look at what that game was on Sunday night I didn't go to Foxborough I didn't go to Indianapolis I played along early I went to Houston I went to Philly and NHL got a season done. The NBA got a season done. Baseball uh, crowned a champ. Football better figure this out in the next eight weeks. This is going to get real sticky without a bubble that they need to make that money. They need to play those games in January. They need to fill those TV slots. America needs this as we're all locked down through the holidays. Well, the NFL better make sure they're not the one that doesn't finish because I-, I am concerned. Well, I mean, I think that, and also you just saw the NCAA in March Madness deciding that they're not going to do all the sites. They're going to try to do one, one location. And so they're recognizing that they have to bubble if they're going to get a, a, a champion crowned as well. I think that the NFL, it's going to be very interesting to look over time how they played this out because they actually were in the most advantageous position. They were the ones who started so late, they could see what everybody else was doing. They could see what worked. They could see, see what didn't work. And they really don't seem to have had much of a plan. They just decided to just play. And you know, we'll have some limited fans or whatever. But they, they chose not to bubble. They've chosen to just sort of go and you look at some of these teams. And the game the other night, you, the, you know, the Patriots are four and five trying to struggle to stay alive when – and no one's even talked about the fact that they had a quarterback, you know, Cam Newton, who hasn't really been the same player since he had COVID. So all of this is, it, it, it makes you wonder, to your point earlier, you shut down things early on in March. And I think sometimes what happens with the public is, is that they begin to realize that maybe this isn't that important, that life does go on. And that's the biggest, if there's a fear that you would have as a, as a sports person in the business, it's we sell the idea that this is essential. We sell the idea that this is crucial. And then when it gets shut down and you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, they restarted baseball, they restarted basketball, they restarted hockey, and I didn't really watch a whole lot of it. And you know what? The world didn't collapse. That's the fear, is that maybe that $3,000 personal seat license and the $1,500 tickets and the whole thing, maybe it's not worth it. Howard Bryan is here. Uh, you follow him out at ESPN, NPR, all sorts of places. He's been on Sports Reporters. We had Bob Ryan on last week. It's uh, 
Hey, this Zoom thing's cool, dude. Like looking at you. I mean, you've called in before and we've run into each other at various events, but to actually look at Bob Ryan, I felt like I was on the sports reporters for a minute or two. Uh, you can follow him out on Twitter. Uh, he does have a book coming out. He's H Bryant four two um, hailing from Boston, but I want to take you West coast here. Cause we have a very, very dear mutual friend in Julio Bermejo out in San Francisco. And, um, Julio and I actually were over in Asia in December. My wife thinks she had COVID uh, in January. My wife was very, very ill when Lamar Jackson was losing to Tennessee back in January. Didn't even go to the Super Bowl. She was down for about a month. Um, and we were over in Asia and having a good time. Give me your favorite Julio Bermejo story because I have about a dozen. Uh, he's been such an incredible part of my life. And I met him in I, – I traveled to Oakland to see the Joe Smith Terps in the spring of 1995 and Mike Maceros, the bassist from the smithereens lived in the Richmond district uh, of San Francisco. And I said to, to Mike, I'm going out to San Francisco, you know, to do this basketball thing, send me someplace good. He said, your first stop needs to be on Geary in the Richmond district at Tommy's Mexican restaurant, go in, go to the bar, ask for Julio and tell him I sent you. Now that's, that's where it all started for me. That's where it starts. That's where it starts for a lot of people. I mean, there are people, there's a great essay uh, Roger Angel uh, wrote on Bob Gibson called Distance back in 1980. And one of the great pieces of that essay is Gibson talking about how the, he's just not very personable. Not only is he, you know, he doesn't remember people's names and he's not personable. And for the most part, it's because he didn't really want to remember people's names. I have never met a person in my life who remembers as much about people with as little information about them as Julio. It's, it's unbelievable. You could walk into Tommy's having not seen him in 25 years and he will remember, he'll remember your name, he'll re he'll remember something about you or make you feel like, you, like you've never left. And there's no greater uh, moment than when you walk into a place and you feel like you, you belong there. My best Julio story, there's just way too many to count, obviously. I think probably 2010 World Series, of course, Giants were in. I got him World Series tickets, and this guy talk about a traveling caravan. Not only, not only was he grateful for the fact that uh, that we got him some World Series tickets. Of course, we'd do anything for Julio, but he, in addition, sends bottles of engraved tequila, you know, Giants logos on the tequila bottles to all the folks at MLB that helped out getting the tickets. An unbelievably generous person, and the best tequila bar in the world. Absolutely. So there's a great plug for our friend Julio Bermejo and uh, Tommy's Mexican. I, you know, I, I want to get off the sports and, and onto the politics and back onto the sports of me being at Wembley Stadium a uh, little over three years ago now. Uh, the SOBs weekend. The Ravens were the first to take a knee. I took a knee in Wembley Station. Angered a few people, as you can imagine, Howard. Uh, and that's okay because I'm still on the, right, the correct side, not the right side, the correct side. Um, and, and three years later, Kaepernick. Um, Trump, the plague, sports stopping, to your point, the NFL's arrogance, most of them Trump supporters, to say, ah, we'll play football in September. Our dear leader says so, and this is just going to go away, and we're going to inject bleach, and on, you know, on and on and on and on, that we are where we are right now, that anyone could have possibly have stuck to sports throughout this particular period of American history. Yeah, it's not going to fly. And it's, and it's not just now. I mean, I think this goes back. What's, what's interesting to me is if you look at it historically, this has really been going on for pretty much the past decade almost. When you look at the, this revival of athletes talking about the world goes, kind of goes back to, to LeBron and Trayvon in the Miami Heat in 2012. And so this new generation, you've gone 40 years without anybody talking because they were afraid of Nike and afraid of their teams and afraid of their jobs and afraid for everything. And now you see players taking a much more active role because of social media and because of all these viral videos and everything else that's in your face. And so I, I think that what's been really interesting this year was to see something that we'd never seen before, which was to see a coordinated walkout en masse, to see basketball not play, then to see tennis not play, then to see baseball not play, and to see hockey not play. That, that was news. That was, if, if I think about what the... the the difference between now and what we've seen over the past couple of years to, for the players to show that they were willing to do that is it's a step. And there were many, many people that I spoke with that thought that the players didn't go far enough. But to me, I thought that that especially Naomi Osaka during the U S open with tennis, I thought that sent a huge message. 
you know, I was into baseball for a long time and I know, you know, you were into baseball for a long time, still are, and, and still, you know, and, and we still are to some degree. I, the football thing's taken over the culture and it sort of leads the way. And I know basketball has led the way in a lot around the world, but in, in America, talking across all factions, football, college, pro, high school, the debate about masks, whether you can go to games, not go to games, the Ravens shut down this week. Um, I find the NFL fascinating because when they did all of this stuff with Kaepernick and they took the other side of it and Jerry's making up his hold hands and all that stuff that's going on, that somehow when the draft happened and the plague began, the whole notion that like it never happened. And I've had a real problem with that with the NFL talking about it at this side while Kaepernick is still literally blackballed. I, I, I find it a very, very thin message from the NFL if that's the direction they're choosing to go. Now, when they're leading with players and players are talking, I'll hear that. But when I see Roger Goodell in the cardigan uh, sipping hot chocolate, taking draft picks at midnight in April, I I didn't buy it. No, and nor should you buy it, nor should anybody buy it. I mean, I thought that what was really sort of crazy about what took place there was that the – the messaging was so obvious that there's never been over the last four years, no industry has been more unambiguous about how it felt about politics and kneeling and all of these things than the NFL. They've been very, very clear about this. And then for them four years later to make it seem as though they're on the right side of justice and suddenly they've had a a George Floyd epiphany was really laughable and they should have been held far more accountable despite the, you know, the video from the players and the, the Odell Beckham Jr. video and the rest of it. But it, it, it is true. The NFL, as, a, as an industry, has wanted to have it both ways. How do, you, how, how do you have end racism in the end zone during your regular season? One, when the word Chiefs is in the end zone. And two, after you've done what you've done to Colin Kaepernick. So they've always wanted to have it both ways. They don't get held very much accountable for it. But anybody who's paying attention can see right through it. I think if you was a baseball guy, maybe it was because you you were in the Ken Burns thing or whatever, which Luke was watching, you know, 10 days a week in the middle of the plague, right? But the football side of you is, you know, you spent some time down in, uh, in Reston and, in, in, uh, you know, Redskin Park and Herndon and all of that stuff. Bringing the thing full circle on, on all of this, why is football so powerful? I mean, I, I think I've seen this over the last 10 weeks where I'm drawn to it on Sundays and Mondays and Thursdays and when they're playing. Not so much the college because I thought that was kind of – that was a little over the line. College shouldn't have been playing. I never thought college should have been playing. Now we're talking about college kids coming back to home from Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving break and all of that. But football so powerful – and Daniel Snyder and what that franchise, I mean, you, you mentioned dog franchises and, you know, franchises that used to matter that don't matter anymore. Uh, I, I still look at football as being the leader, and I think it has to do with the holidays. I think it has to do with everybody being shut in on Thanksgiving and Christmas and everybody being home in the winter, that over the course of our lifetime, that's what's made – tying football to family and holidays is what's made it what it is over the course of my 52 years. Yeah, I, I tend to think that it's part of the routine. It's the, it's the television. It's always been the fact that the, the sport itself is translated best to television. And it's also, I think, that people have made a, they've made a deal with themselves that this is the game that they, it, it, it speaks closer to maybe their worldview. In, you know, we live in an anti-labor country. Football is the sport where the players have the least amount of power. We live in a violent country. Sport, you know, football is the, is the one where you sort of sanction the most violence. We live in a, we live in a country where it, we, we have this, this sort of faux idea of, of toughness and this idea of the sort of military overlay in sports. You know, football does that more than all the other sports, although post 9-11, they all try to have some camouflage in their jerseys these days. So football sort of has done the best job of trying to sell America the, 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 the idea of itself. You start thinking about this country in general. You, how many places can you go where you can actually be physical anymore, right, with all of these different political messages that we send to each other? The, the country's moving in a different direction, and so people want to go to a place where they can 
have some idea of violence still where you can you know so you you sell the military you sell mma you sell football these are the areas where you can actually sort of sanction that sort of visceral um physicality that that people like to feel as part of their identity and the nfl also has done something that other sports haven't necessarily done so well and that's they have kept a national identity we were talking about baseball to start this conversation baseball has decided that it's a regional sport I don't know why they've done that, but baseball has decided. Hey, you and I grew up with with Reggie and as a national guy. The Yankees were a national team. The Orioles, everybody knew all of these guys. But baseball is a regional game, and so football. They've ceded the space to football as to you know to be the national sport. It's the one thing that sort of brings everyone together. And of course, never underestimate the power of the Super Bowl still to this day. I want to layer this on top because you sit on Massachusetts soil right now, wet Massachusetts soil, based on what I saw the other night. Um, the tribal part of this, right? The, the tribal part of sports that I've seen in Raven Steelers, Orioles versus everyone, Baltimore versus Pittsburgh, Terps versus Carolina refs, you know, all of that, Yankees, Red Sox, all of that plays itself out now, especially – uh, for those on the right side with red hats in that if Bill Belichick said he didn't cheat, by God, he didn't cheat. Those monkeys with the cameras, none of that. You know, that's my team. There's no way Tom Brady took the air out of those footballs. There's no way Jose Altuve. I'm Venezuelan. I'm an Astro. He, he would never do. And the evidence is so damning, you know, in every case that the tribal part of all of it is played out now in America when we vote and on what side of the aisle we sit on, because clearly in the aftermath of Trumpism in four years, there are 70 million people who think he hasn't told a lie and thinks that he's looking out for them. I mean, I find that to be fascinating. Yeah. I don't think it has much to do with lies or truth anymore. I think that you side with your side. And I think that's really what it's been. I don't think people, I mean, maybe people believe that, you know, that this entire election has been was fraudulent maybe deep down they really honestly truly believe that if they do i feel sorry for them necessarily you know but i also think that people have decided that that you ride on you know you're in baltimore it's the wire if it's a lie we fight on that lie right this is what it's going to be and i think that that is the the attitude that a lot of people have and i think that I think there's been a, a feeling over the past several years that we were invincible in terms of our abilities to to have different opinions and have different and, and while having the same values. And I think over the last four years, it's really been proven that they're not the same. Right. You can't you know, we're we've always taken the position that, OK, well, you know, you like Coke. I like Pepsi. You're a Burger King guy. I'm a McDonald's guy. But at the end of the day, we're the same. Right. Or you may think that this is the best way to balance a budget. I may think this is the best way to balance a budget. But both but both of us agree in what America and what democracy is. Right. It's not true. We have the, the values and the opinions are so different that this the last several years have shown us we don't look at the world the same way, that there is a gigantic split down the middle in terms of how people feel. And it has driven me insane the way people like to sort of make fun of Donald Trump and laugh about it and call it a fringe and call it a cult or whatever. Yeah, you can have fun with that, with those memes if you want, but the bottom line is 73 million people signed onto this. That's not a cult. That's who you are as a country. Well, the tribal part of it would be like making me a Steelers fan. You know what I mean? Like, I can like Mike Tomlin, and I do. We exchanged some pleasantries last week, actually. But, uh, but the notion that a Red Sox fan could ever become a Yankees fan, or, you know, like, that's... That, that's the tribal part that I think sports has taught us that ha, you know, we, we learned to hate the rival high school or the rival city or whatever it is, that you could never move to Pittsburgh if you were from Baltimore and fly a Raven. You know what I mean? That, that's where we are with the Trump flags in, in, in the countryside. And that's an amazing thing to me, that the shooting in Fifth Avenue, that that, that appears to be very, very true. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I think being in the business, I don't, I've never viewed it that way. I mean, I was never that tribal a sports fan anyway. I always root for players. So I, that stuff never hit me. I mean, I. But I you do it, understand that was your audience, right? Absolutely. You know, that's the audience. Because you know, that's how everybody else reacts. I mean, I never understand. I mean, I, I understand it, but it just was never me personally. That's all. I mean, obviously you get it. And I always, when people talk like that, I always say, well, you do realize that in the free agent, there are all these guys change teams anyway. 
And if you're really thinking about this, it's, it's all a question of identity. It's all a question of what it is that you, you know, wh why have you chosen this to represent you? And it, it is an interesting thing that it's so important. It's really not that important. But when you look at, you know, the way that we've set this up, the way that it's been sold to you, that it is important and people buy into it and they believe it and, and they believe it even when their team moved, like Baltimore, you know, that's not really your team. If you're of a different generation, your team's in Indianapolis. And so all of these different things sort of take a, a uh, the, the tribalism is part of the sale. And not only is it part of the sale, but in some ways it's part of the swindle. And you would hope that we would be smarter to see through it because at the end of the day, when you look at who's on what side, it really is the billionaires against everybody else. If you're, if you're really keeping score at home. Well, the swindle with the Orioles is well documented for me over the last 15 years of getting thrown out, my name being Aparicio and having a press pass for 22 years and being told there's the door if you're going to write the truth. And I said, well, fine, I'll stand out here and write the truth. And 15 years later, the swindle, I think, is very apparent. You know what I mean? Like literally about what it was supposed to do for the city and the economy and packing hotels and good for the community and Cal Ripken and Boog Pal and Brooks. You know, a generation later, I sit here and look at my pockets and I look at the city's pockets and I look at what's happened to it. And um, it, it is, it, it's very disappointing. It really is a lifetime later. Yeah, well, I mean, you can see through it. I mean, it's just, you know, but once again, this is something, you know, sports, sports is something that people need. For us, it's how we make a living. But for a lot of people, it's their entertainment. This is the one thing that they have. It's the one thing they hold on to. It's the something that, that after it, after a day of getting their butt whooped at work, they want to come home and, re and relax to something and they don't want that to be disturbed and they don't want that. No, they want that to be, they want that to be um, undisturbed at all times. And so are unspoiled. And that being the case, you can see how people are willing to uh, make excuses for the industry. And I think the other part of it too, is there's this wonderful and bizarre sort of resentment that you have toward these athletes that you idolize and at the same time really can't stand in some ways because of their talent and the money that they make. All right. So I, I found this. This is uh, actually sitting on the set. This is uh, one of a Julio special. So I, I just did it, it. It has a San Francisco giant related shirt in here of, uh, of Julio. So I figured I'd make you want to go get a shot of tequila at some point here, Howard. All oh, right? I know. I got, I got my stash over in the kitchen over there. Well, hey, man, always great to visit with you. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask, stay away from people, keep writing great stuff. And I definitely want to get you back on in uh, 21 when Full Dissident uh, comes out in, in full written form. We can purchase it and promote it and do all that good stuff, okay? Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, man. Howard Bryant, longtime sports writer, ESPN, NPR, and uh, Boston, and uh, Full Dissident. You can follow him at hbryant42 out on Twitter and, uh, and, and read up. Um, no one covering – culture and sports and politics doing this right now better than Howard. I am Nestor. You can find me anywhere the internet takes you at baltimorepositive.com at wnst.net am 1570 where we have mixed sports and Baltimore and whatever this pandemic thing is to bring you intelligent conversation.